All right, let's go into unit 16, which covers farming businesses. Now, this is the only unit that we have that's dedicated to a specific activity because there's lots of special rules that apply to farmers specifically. And as I mentioned in earlier webinars, it's a hit or miss thing whether or not the IRS is gonna test you on farmers. Either you'll get <laughs> several questions about farmers or you might not see any at all. All right, the, the farming questions are considered part of the specialized returns uh, questions. Farming businesses may be engaged in activities such as crop production, animal production, or forestry and logging. The entity type doesn't matter, although there's specific rules that apply just to sole proprietorships and partnerships with uh, farming activities, especially with regard to estimated payments. Now, a business will be classified as a farming business as long as the business cultivates, operates, or manages a farm or a fishery for profit. Now, there are many types of activities that qualify as farms, and I know that some of you have done farming returns, and maybe some of you have never done a farming return at all. But there are a lot of things that qualify as farming that you might not immediately think, oh, this is a farm. So agricultural farming includes the cultivation of any type of agricultural crop, such as grains, beans, industrial hemp, cotton, flowers, vegetables, etc. So it doesn't have to be food. So it doesn't have to be food for human consumption. Someone who just grows flowers like daisies or roses, that would also be considered a farm. Okay, dairy farming. This is a class of farming for long-term production of milk and dairy products. So it can be a farm with dairy cows. It can also be a dairy where it's goats and they're milking the goats, you know, selling goat's milk or creating cheese with that milk. Fish farming includes any type of fishery, involves raising fish or shellfish commercially, usually for human consumption. Silk farming, the cultivation of silkworms to produce silk. So if you are breeding insects, then that can qualify as a farm as well. Fur farming, this is a business that breeds and raises fur bearing animals for their pelts. Like if it's a farmer that's breeding like mink or some other fur bearing animal and those animals are going to be used for their pelts, then that's also classified as a farming business. And then apiculture, which is beekeeping. So if it's a business that raises bees to collect the products that the hive produces, like honey or beeswax, that's also a farm. And this has its own business code, apiculture. There's a lot of things that qualify as farms that you might not immediately think, oh, this is a farm, like the silk farming, or they're or breeding silkworms, which is an insect, in order to produce silk. That's also a farm, okay? Now, a farming or fishing business um, operating as a sole proprietorship reports income and loss on Schedule F, profit or loss from farming. So it's almost like a Schedule C, but the expense categories are different. And then a farming or fishing business can also be a partnership or a corporation as well, okay? all Those are all farming businesses if they do an activity like one of these here and they're doing it in order to generate a profit. Now not classified as farming businesses. So you need to know what doesn't qualify as a farming business even though the activity might be related to farming. These businesses specifically do not qualify as farms. If it's a veterinary business, if it's a business that only supplies farm labor or farming equipment. So if it's a business that's just like renting farm equipment to farmers, the rental business itself is not a farm, all right? Businesses that only sell farm supplies, such as pesticides or herbicides. Businesses that are only in the breeding uh, of household pets, like a dog breeder or a cat breeder wouldn't be considered a farmer. Businesses that provide agricultural services such as soil preparation and fertilization, but don't actually do any actual farming of the land. All right, none of these would be classified as farms. And I think you have to remember the cat 
and dog breeding one. The IRS has asked about that before. So if it's just a pet breeder, then that's not a farmer. Not classified as farming income. Certain types of income associated with farming businesses are not classified as farm income. Farm income does not include any of the following. Wages that are earned by a farm employee. So if it's just an employee working on a farm, then that's not farming income, okay? Income received under a contract for grain harvesting with workers and machines furnished by the taxpayer. Gains received from the sale of farmland and depreciable farm equipment. Gains from the sale of securities, regardless of who owns the securities, right? So if it's a farmer, <laughs> legitimately a farmer, and the farmer owns stock and sells that stock, then the gains from the sale of the stock is never going to be it's never going to be classified as farming income all right and that's regardless of whether it's a sole proprietorship or a partnership or a corporation passive rental income received from the rental of farmland where the owner of the land does not materially participate and land can be rented just like buildings can be rented that's considered passive activity income but there's special rules when it comes to farmers and there's also special forms that landowners use when it's a farmland rental and i'm going to give you examples in this webinar because sometimes the irs will ask about that too the rental of farmland all right farming rents so if a farmer rents his farmland for someone else to use the revenue generated is generally classified as rental income and not farming income. And it's passive rental income generally, which means it's not subject to self-employment tax, which is a benefit, right? If it's farming income that's listed on the Schedule F, then it's going to be subject to self-employment tax. But then again, if you have losses, then those losses are not going to be limited like they would be with passive rental activities. So there's pluses and minuses there. Now, this also applies to crop shares when a tenant farmer pays a proportion of the crop harvest proceeds to the landowner for the use of his farmland. And I have to discuss this because the IRS has asked specifically about this form, all right, which is the form 4835. So this is called share cropping or cropping. And this is a passive activity and it's reported on form 4835, farm rental income and expenses. All right, this is a special form and it's just for share cropping or cropping when there's a rental of farmland. On the other hand, if a farmer simply rents his pasture or other real property for a flat cash amount without providing any services to the tenant, he will report the income as rent on schedule E. If a farmer materially participates in farming operations on the land that he owns, the rent is considered farm income and is reported on Schedule F, right? Just like a Schedule C taxpayer. And I'm going to give you three examples so you understand how this works. Okay, got to, you got to understand the differences for the test here. All right, example number one. Harold is a farmer who owns 200 acres of pasture land in Wyoming. Harold rents out his pasture to someone else who owns the cattle, right? So Harold is renting out his pasture land and someone else actually owns the cattle that's going to be on his land. Harold also takes care of the cattle for a fee. Since he is materially participating in the activity as well as providing services, see, he's providing services. So what does this remind you of? This is like a hotel or a motel owner or like a bed and breakfast. So he's providing services to the owner of the cattle. He's providing services by taking daily care of the livestock. Then the income is reporting is reported on his Schedule F as ordinary income. All right, and it would be subject to self-employment tax because this is just like, you know, a hotel or a motel owner. He owns the land, but he's also taking care of the cattle daily right? You can't just <laughs> leave the cows to their own devices, right? So he's providing substantial services, right? Just like a hotel or a motel owner. So that's going to go on the Schedule F, the income, and it's going to be taxed as ordinary income. It's farming income, and it'll be subject to self-employment tax, just like a hotel or a motel owner. All right. Okay. Example number two. 
Norris also owns pasture land in Wyoming. They might be neighbors, right? <laughs> so Norris also owns pasture land in Wyoming. Norris, on the other hand, simply rents out the pasture to other farmers for a flat cash amount, right? It's just like a regular passive rental activity and he's getting paid cash every month, let's say, for the rent of his pasture. He does not provide any services or take care of the livestock in any way. Norris would report the income as rental income on Schedule E, which is basically the same treatment that, that, that if it was a residential rental with month-to-month -month tenants, same treatment. The income would be passive activity income and not subject to self-employment tax. Okay, okay. Okay, example number three. This is the third scenario. Anna owns a 90 acre farm in Montana. She generally rents out her land to a tenant farmer and does not do any of the planting herself. So she owns the land and she's renting out the land to a tenant farmer. The tenant farmer is the sharecropper. Anna rents the land to a sharecropper who grows organic beets. Anna's contract with the tenant farmer requires the sharecropper pay 25% of the crops harvested. So this would be typical. She's not actually working the land and the tenant farmer doesn't pay her cash. He's paying a portion of the crop. That's sharecropping. So Anna reports her share of the income from the crops on form 4835. So she's not going to use schedule E in this case. There's a special form that's just for sharecropping activities. And the income is still passive, not subject to self-employment tax because she's not actually working the land. So she's gonna report the income from the sharecropping activity on a special form 4835, which is going to be attached to her form 1040. She doesn't file a schedule F. Now Anna's tenant farmer, who's the sharecropper, would be required to report his income on the schedule F as regular farming income subject to self-employment tax. So the tenant farmer is the one <laughs> who actually has farming income. And the tenant farmer would report his income and loss on Schedule F. And then basically, the he's renting the farmland just like someone would rent an office for their regular business, right? Right. So the tenant farmer files a Schedule F and Anna files a Form 4835 to report her income from the sharecropping activity. And it's considered passive income to her not subject to self-employment tax, all right, because it's a rental income, but it's a share crop rental, different form, okay? Okay. All right, estimated taxes for farmers. We've already discussed this a little bit in the earlier webinars, but I want you to memorize this for the test, that when it's a farmer and at least two thirds of their gross income comes from a qualified farming activity, that they don't have to make estimated payments like other self-employed people. They're allowed to make just one estimated payment and that's it. And they won't be subject to an estimated tax penalty for not paying quarterly estimated payments throughout the year, basically like everybody else has to do. The farmer does not have to pay estimated tax if he files his return and pays all the tax owed by March 1st. If the farmer cannot file their return by March 1st, or for example, they want to file on extension, they're, they're allowed to do that. But if, if they can't get the return filed and the estimated tax paid by March 1st, it's not March 15th, okay? Don't confuse this date with the due date for S-Corp returns and partnership returns. It's March 1st. If the farmer can't file the return by March 1st, then they can make one annual estimated payment on January 15th and that'll be fine. And then they can file their tax return basically later on in the year. You know, if they file an extension, then they could presumably file as late as October 15th. As long as they make this annual estimated payment by January 15th, then they won't be subject to an estimated tax penalty. But this only applies if the farmer's income, if at least two thirds of their income comes from a qualified farming activity. Okay, okay, all right. Now, let's talk about income averaging. <laughs> income averaging is just for farmers. Farmers are the only ones that get to do this. And there's a special schedule just for income averaging for farmers. It's Schedule J, 
All right. Now, those of you who do farming returns, then you've probably seen this schedule before, but a lot of preparers have never seen this schedule. Schedule J. So self-employed farmers are allowed to average their farming income. Nobody else gets to do this. No, no other business gets to like average their income in order to lower their tax liability in the current year. Okay, just farmers and fishermen. They're allowed to average their income by using income tax rates from the three prior years. These are called base years. And then the farm income averaging allows farmers to lower their tax liability when their income varies greatly from one year to the next. All right, I just, I think you need to know this schedule. Schedule J, it's just for farmers. And it's, if you have a farmer who had low income for two years in a row, for example, and then they had like a bumper crop this year, then they're allowed to actually go back and do income averaging using the Schedule J in order to lower their tax liability in the current year. Like I said, nobody else gets to do this, just farmers. All right. And this is what the Schedule J looks like. See it right here, Schedule J. And it says income averaging for farmers and fishermen. And then the taxpayer basically enters their taxable income for the current year at the top. And they're able to average their income from the prior three years in order to lower their tax liability in the current year. So just so you can see it. Okay, accounting methods for farming. So farmers are allowed to use any accounting method that other businesses can use. So a farmer can use the cash method, they can use the accrual method, they can use the hybrid method, that's all permitted. But there's a special method called the crop method that just applies to farmers. And I think you need to know about it because the IRS has asked about this before. You need to know that this method exists. It's just for farmers. And if a farmer wants to use the crop method, they have to ask the IRS for permission in order to do it, okay? Now, the crop method, with the crop method, they have to get IRS approval first. It's only allowed for farming businesses, and it's designed for businesses where the crop is planted in one year, but is not harvested until a future year. With the crop method, the farmer can capitalize the entire cost of producing the crop, including the expense of seed or young plants, and then deduct those costs in the year the income is actually realized, right? So this would prevent a farmer from, for example, if it was a crop where it wasn't going to be, where they weren't going to harvest until, you know, 12 months later or over a year later, but you have all the costs of planting and seeds and fertilizer and everything else in one year, and then you're going to have a huge, you know, gain in a future year when you actually harvest the crop. So <laughs> you don't, you wouldn't want to have just like huge losses and no income in this year, and then a huge amount of income in the, in the next year with no ex expenses to offset it, right? So the crop method allows a farmer to basically, basically capitalize all the costs of the crop, of producing the crop, like seeds and fertilizer and everything else, and then actually expense those costs in the year that the crop is harvested. That's the crop method. And I, like I said, I think you just, you need to know that this exists because it is a valid accounting method. And sometimes on the EA exam, they'll give you a list and say, which one is not a valid accounting method. So it's cash accrual, the hybrid method and the crop method are all valid, but sometimes they'll throw one in there that doesn't actually exist, the business method or whatever. All right, farming inventory. You have to know what qualifies as farming inventory. So farming inventory includes all items that are held for sale or purchased for resale and for use as feed or seed, such as the following. Eggs in the process of hatching. Any harvested farm products that are held for sale to customers, such as grain, cotton, flowers, industrial hemp, corn, or tobacco, right? So these are all harvest, harvested products. Supplies that become a physical part of an item held for sale, such as containers, wrappers, or other packaging. Any livestock held primarily for sale or purchased for resale. All right, so you need to know what kind of livestock is inventory 
and what kind of livestock is not inventory because the IRS has asked about that specifically on prior exams. If the IRS says it's market livestock, then that livestock is inventory, okay? Any purchased farm products that are being held for seed or feed, such as hay, silage, concentrates, fodder, or pelleted feeds. Okay, farm inventory does not include real property such as farmland or buildings or depreciable equipment such as tractors. So you would never include buildings in inventory and you wouldn't include depreciable equipment in inventory either. If it was something like a tractor or a thresher or a cotton ginning machine or something like that, that would never be included in inventory. That's equipment, all right, depreciable equipment, okay? If a farming business is required to capitalize and track an inventory, the farmer may use the same inventory methods that are available to any other business. And those are covered in your book, right? So the farmer can use FIFO or LIFO, that's fine. But there are two inventory methods that are unique to farming businesses. And this is the farm price method and the unit livestock price method. I think, I just think you need to know that these exist. All right, so in addition to something like FIFO, LIFO, those, those types of inventory methods are very commonplace with other businesses, but farmers specifically can use these two types as well. All right, so they can use any other inventory method that any other business uses, that's fine. But they can also use the farm price method and the unit livestock price method. So these two inventory methods are unique to farming businesses. All right, depreciation of farm assets. So farmers are allowed to use any depreciation methods available to other business types, but there are some unique rules for farmers with regard to depreciation. With regards to accelerated depreciation, farmers are allowed to use section 179 and bonus depreciation just like any other business. Qualified property for both section 179 and bonus depreciation may be new or used. So the thresholds are the same, you know, the for Section 179, we talked about that in the earlier webinars, the same spending cap applies. So if it's a farmer and it's a very large farm, for example, and they put, you know, more than the spending cap, more than 3.5 million plus in depreciable assets into service in the same year, then they wouldn't be eligible to use Section 179 just like any other business once they reach that spending cap. But farmers are allowed to use Section 179 and bonus depreciation just like any other business. Okay. Now, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act modified the depreciation recovery period for new farm equipment. New, specifically new. And I don't know why they did this, but the, <laughs> they, they changed the depreciation recovery period for new farm equipment and machinery placed into service during the year. The recovery period has been shortened from seven years to five years, but just for new equipment, used equipment is still seven years. And I don't know, I don't know why Congress did this, but they did. And there's additional footnotes in your book if you want to read about it. But if it's specifically new farm equipment and it's machinery, then it has a depreciation period of five years. But if a farmer buys used machinery, then it's a seven year depreciation period may, under makers. Farmers may use the 200% declining balance method for makers depreciation for farming assets, right? So they can use the 200% declining balance method for farming assets. In prior years, most farming property was depreciated using the 150% declining balance method. But if a farmer wants to use straight line, they can. And then if they qualify for bonus or section 179, they can take accelerated depreciation too. Farmers have more options now in order to basically mm, get their depreciation number exactly where they want it. Because they can choose to use the 200% declining balance method, they can choose to use straight line, they can choose to use accelerated depreciation. So you can kind of manipulate the numbers on the return if the farmer purchased assets and basically decide how much depreciation you want to take on each particular asset, basically to get your taxable income exactly where you want it. All right. Okay. And this is assuming that the, <laughs> that the farmer purchased assets that were eligible for depreciation, right? Okay.
Qualifying depreciable property for farming businesses. It's basically the same as other businesses, but you have to remember, as I mentioned about the livestock, that if it's market livestock, it's inventory. But if it's livestock held for draft, breeding or dairy purposes, then it's treated as an asset instead of inventory. Okay, so draft means like a draft horse, a horse that you're using on the farm. Okay, breeding means it's a it's an animal that you're retaining for breeding, like a prize bull that you're using for insemination or like a stallion that's used for breeding. That would be livestock that was held for breeding. The, the farmer is keeping it. Okay, the farmer is keeping it. And then livestock that's held for dairy purposes. Like I said, this would be like cows that were being, you know, used on the farm for the production of milk. That's not market livestock. Okay, these are assets. And they're eligible for Section 179. They're eligible for bonus. And they can also be depreciated using those other methods, this type of livestock. Okay. And then single purpose agricultural or horticultural structures. The IRS has asked about this before. So you have to know what a single purpose agricultural or horticultural structure is. This is a structure that is technically real property, right? It's attached to the land. <laughs> Nobody's moving it. It's got a foundation probably. And it's a structure, right? But it's not treated as real estate under the code if it just has a single purpose. So this would be something like a milking parlor, a piggery, and a greenhouse. And then, of course, that non-residential improvement property and the fruit and nut bearing trees and qualified improvement property would also qualify for Section 179 and bonus, just like it would for any other business. But I want you to understand the single purpose thing. <laughs> All right. Okay. So the IRS position is basically that if you're going to treat an asset like a single purpose agricultural or horticultural structure, that means that it's going to be eligible for Section 179 or bonus, which means you could expense that cost right away. Right. And something like a grain silo, a grain silo where it's just used to hold grain. Those are really expensive. I looked up the price this year and they're like 300,000 bucks, <laughs> like 300,000 bucks, 400,000 bucks for a grain silo. So this would be a huge expense if you were taking it under Section 179 or bonus, if you were taking accelerated depreciation on one of these items. Right. They're pricey. So even though it's permanently attached to the land, these structures are not treated as real property, the real estate. They're not treated as real property, even though they might have a foundation and everything, all right, and a door <laughs> and all of that, okay? The IRS is really serious about what qualifies as a single purpose structure. Single purpose structures have a 10-year class life under makers. It's 10-year property. Right, so they're eligible for Section 179 and bonus depreciation, but it genuinely has to be single purpose. This is from an example on the IRS website. So if you have a greenhouse and it's only used to grow plants, then that's single purpose. And if it costs, you know, a million bucks, that greenhouse, then the farmer could expense that using Section 179 or bonus depreciation. And that's fine. But if the farmer puts a cash register or a sales kiosk inside the greenhouse so that the farmer can sell plants in addition to growing them there, then the greenhouse is no longer single purpose property. And then it has to be treated as real estate. Okay, so you can't do that. It has to be single purpose, which means if it's a greenhouse to grow plants, then the only thing that you can do inside that greenhouse is grow plants. <laughs> Stick a cash register in one corner and all of a sudden it's not a single purpose structure anymore. And now it's real estate. All right. So this is, you got to be careful. Disposition of farm assets. Income reported on Schedule F does not include gains or losses from the sale or disposition of the following assets. Farmland, depreciable farm equipment, barns, stables, and other types of farm buildings, livestock held for draft, breeding, sport, or dairy purposes, right? So remember the draft, breeding, sport, or dairy purposes. Those are assets. 
If it's market livestock, then it's inventory. And if the sale of inventory is just ordinary income, just like it would be to any other business. All right, but if it's livestock that's held for draft, breeding, sport, or dairy purposes, and you're depreciating those animals <laughs> as assets, then the disposition of those assets goes on form 4797. All right, so the sale of these assets is reported on form 4797, sales of business property, and may result in ordinary or capital gains or losses. And you, it's better to have this treatment. Who wouldn't want a capital gain rather than, rather than an ordinary gain? It's better to have capital gains. They're taxed at a lower tax rate. So why wouldn't you want to have capital gain? So if you have the opportunity to treat these assets as assets, then you should. But the sale of these farm assets is reported on 4797, sales, or, sales of business property, and may result in ordinary or capital gains or losses. Okay, postponing gain due to weather conditions. So farmers are allowed to postpone gain due to weather conditions. If a farmer sells more livestock, including poultry, than he normally would in a year because of a drought, flood, or other weather-related conditions. The farmer is allowed to postpone reporting the income from the additional animals until the following year. The taxpayer must meet all of the following conditions to qualify. The principal trader business must be farming. The farmer must use the cash method of accounting. So remember this for the test. They have to be on the cash method in order to do this, okay? The farmer must be able to show that he would not have sold the additional animals in the year except for the weather-related condition, and the area must be designated as eligible for federal disaster assistance. Now, here's the kicker. <laughs> here's the kicker. The livestock does not have to be raised or sold in the affected area. So it doesn't, the, the livestock doesn't actually have to be in the FEMA disaster area, but the sale of the livestock has to occur because of the related, uh, because of the weather related condition. So if there was a flood, you know, 20 miles away from where you have your farm and that flood somehow affected the water or grazing or some other requirements of your livestock and you had to sell animals, more animals than you would have sold in the current year, then the farmer is allowed to postpone the gain from the sale of the additional animals. All right. And you don't, it, it makes it sound like you have to have all kinds of proof in order to do this, but you just have to, you just have to attach a statement to the return in order to postpone the gain and basically say, yeah, there's, this affected the, you know, my cows or my pigs and I'm postponing the gain because of this weather related condition. And the farmer, if they have multiple types of animals, they have to figure the amount to be postponed separately for each generic class of animals, such as hogs, sheep, and cattle. So if they have multiple different types of livestock on their farm, then they would have to figure out the amount that they're gonna postpone for each class of livestock. But all there's no special form, <laughs> no special form for this. They just have to attach a statement to their tax return, provi providing information about the weather related conditions and the circumstances that led to the problem that they had with the livestock and basically how much they're going to postpone to the following year. All right. Okay. Nobody else gets to do this. All right. Nobody else gets to postpone gain due to weather conditions, just farmers. All right, crop insurance and government payments. So insurance proceeds, including government disaster payments, may be received as a result of destruction or damage to crops or the inability to plant crops because of drought, flood, or another natural disaster. These payments are generally taxable in the year they are received. However, <laughs> some farmers can elect to postpone reporting the income until the following year if they meet all of these conditions. The farming business must use the cash method of accounting again. All right. So if they're on accrual, they can't do this. All right. It has to be the cash method. The crop insurance proceeds were received in the same tax year that the crops were damaged. 
And then under normal business practices, the farming business would have reported income from the damaged crops in any tax year following the tax year the damage occurred. So let's say you planted a crop of soybeans and you would have harvested them in the following year, but they were destroyed by a flood or some other kind of natural disaster in the current year and you received a crop insurance payment. The farmer can delay reporting the income from that crop insurance payment to the following year, assuming they would have actually harvested that crop in the following year as well. And once again, there's no special form for this. So the farmer just has to attach a statement to the tax return indicating the specific crops that were damaged and the total insurance payment that was received. To make this election to postpone income, the farmer must have uh, must be able to prove that the crops would have been harvested or otherwise sold in the following year. All right, you just have to attach a statement and that's it. Now, if a farmer foregoes the planting of crops altogether, so if the, if the farmer doesn't plant anything and they receive an agricultural program payment from the government for not planting crops, this is a type of farm subsidy, okay? Then the payments are reported on Schedule F and the full amount of the payment is subject to self-employment tax. All right, which is odd, right? So the farmer is getting paid basically not to plant anything. That's an agricultural program payment. If the farmer gets paid not to plant anything and they're not planting anything, they're not doing anything, but they get a payment from the government for not planting, then it's farming income and it's reported on Schedule F and the full amount of the payment is subject to self-employment tax as if they were actually working. All right, weird, huh? Don't you think? Okay, anyway. Okay, other unique tax rules for farmers. So there are some special rules that are unique to farming businesses, other special rules. Now, one of the special rules that applies to farmers is if, if they have car and truck expenses for the use of a vehicle, they can claim 75% of the use of a car or a light truck as business use without any records. They don't need to keep a mileage log if the vehicle is used most of the day in a farming business. Crazy, right? So they don't have to keep a mileage log. They're able to claim 75% of the use of a car or a light truck as business use without any records. No mileage log for farmers. They don't have to. Of course they can, especially if they want to take 100%, right? If it's a truck that's only used on the farm, then maybe they should get a mileage log but they can claim 75 percent of the use of a car or a light truck without a mileage log they don't need to have one soil conservation farmers can choose to deduct as a business expense land related expenses for soil or water conservation or for the preser uh, for the prevention of erosion these examples include leveling eradication of brush removal of trees or planting of windbreaks Although farmland itself is not depreciable, land conservation expenses or other costs to improve the land for farming or growing crops are deductible as business expenses. For most other businesses, these types of land improvements would be considered non-deductible capital expenses and would have to be added to the basis of the land. All right. <laughs> We've spent several webinars talking about how you can't deduct you know, the cost of removing tree stumps or destroying an existing foundation or, you know, any kind of land improvements where it's where it's leveling or adding soil or anything else like that. Generally, those costs have to be added to the basis of the land and they increase the basis of the land and those costs can't be taken as a current business expense. But with farmers, if it's farmland, they're allowed to deduct these costs as a business expense. They're allowed to deduct these costs as a business expense and nobody else gets to do this, all right? So if they eradicate brush or remove stumps or if they plant windbreaks, like a row of trees is a windbreak, or if they, if they level the land, like add more soil or that, all of that is deductible as a business expense, even though it's land. All right, farmers get to do this. They get to deduct soil conservation expenses as, a, as an immediate business expense. Okay, excise tax credits. Farmers may be eligible to claim a credit or a refund of federal excise taxes on fuel used on the farm. 
All right, so unique rules just for farmers. There's a lot of them. This isn't this isn't all of them. There's many. So if you want to get into this type of type of business and have farmers in your client base, then it's good to do a little research in this regard. There's several programs out there just for farm accounting where you can take classes just on farm accounting and learn about all these special rules that apply to farmers. So it's kind of a unique industry and there's a lot of special rules that apply to them. All right. Okay. Okay. Next unit is going to be unit 17, which is nonprofit organizations.